anxiety or fear. Mm -hmm. And so rather than acknowledging that I'm afraid or I'm anxious about this situation, I may get angry. Or rather than acknowledging that I'm really sad about something, I may be angry. So it's, you know, one of the things that I would oftentimes ask my clients who came in manifesting just, you know, a lot of anger, I said, if you weren't so angry, what else might you be feeling? You know? And it's a so, trick. Uh, I'd well, get, I would be so mad at a counselor for asking me that. I'd well, get more angry. And I would like, say... What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Exactly. Yeah. And so then we would explore, you know, because oftentimes the anger protects people from having to acknowledge the sadness or the fear. And I hate to be... This shows my age. I hate to be too gender specific, but it's a technique more used in uh, by men than women. Mm-hmm. Women tend to use sadness to disguise what they're really uh, feeling. Men tend to use anger. Okay, that's just. Is, is there? Do you think there's a generational um, component of that breakdown? I, it seems like older men definitely have a reputation for for masking their emotions with anger more than younger men, or masking them in general. Yeah. Masking, yeah, and I think that that's all part of yeah culture and uh, I wonder what, socialization. What, what, what do you why? think impacts? Do you think it's just socialization? I think uh, like that we. I was able to interact with more people than my father and his father and his father and his father. Well, I, I think some of it is, but but for the anger, the other emotions generally seen are, is non-masculine. Exactly. Right, and so I, I'm okay showing anger. It's the if it's the only one that society lets me show to feel masculine, I'm I'm going to stuff down my sadness. My uh, I'm not going to have high ranges of happiness. The real weird is, yeah, the real weird one is men who won't allow you to show that they're, won't allow themselves to be seen happy. I saw this video of Trace Adkins, you know, the country singer, sure. uh, the other day, and it was on the internet, like, as a joke, He him reacting to his, grand, becoming a grandfather. And they're like, hey, Trace, you know, how does it feel to be a grandfather? And he goes, all right and you're like what like what are you talking about and they kept pressing him like you know when was your baby born uh sometime november i think you know i don't remember and uh this this had happened a while back obviously it wasn't recent and all the every question they asked he, he acted like he didn't care now he was smiling for some of the answers yeah he wasn't it wasn't you didn't think that he didn't care but he absolutely was not going to let you think he was happy, and I just thought it was so. That, odd. That's interesting. It was it was like really sad actually. But that's you know so so it's interesting that that, that that's the outlet. You're kind of going sideways as you said, not dealing with some of the grief can can express itself in in anger for men more readily than it would be for women if you want to be gender specific on that because of the masculine trait that that you know abuse versus sadness or happiness or, you know, so forth. So in, in working with a lot of people, whether it's through grief uh, recovery or recovery, some of the other, you know, abuses or, or, or so forth, uh, what, what bad decisions do you normally see people making that is, that is impeding their recovery? Oh, goodness. Um, that's, whew. well, you know, the gamut. I mean, bad relationship choices. Um, um, bad relationship choices would probably be the primary uh, manifestation of someone with an abuse history. What's a what's a bad relationship choice uh, look like? Where you are in other a relationship. Other than all the women that dump me. <laughs> well, where you Wait, are. I'm really surprised you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> You might want to schedule an appointment after this, you know, so we can discuss that more thoroughly. Uh, well, in other words, people who tend to get in the same old, same old over and over and over again, you know, uh, generally when someone has a history of abuse, whether it's 
sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, emotional mm-hmm. abuse, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse. Yeah. Uh, they are going to tend to get into relationships that will replicate that same kind of experience so that they can maybe even unknowingly try to have mastery over that. They feel, experience, it feels that familiar as well. It's very familiar. It's so, very familiar. And so they say, oh, this is so familiar. I know how to do this. Uh-huh. And so they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Whereas to change some, not just the choice of who you're in the relationship, but maybe how you are responding to dynamics within the relationship because you're too afraid or it's too threatening or I will lose the relationship if I, you know, speak up, uh, whatever, to, to try to change those is very threatening. And that's why it's important for the person who has come in to see a counselor to work through those kinds of changes in the therapeutic setting. In yeah. other words, if they've never confronted another person who they perceive has more power or more control than them, it's real important that in the therapeutic setting they give themselves permission to say, I don't, just, I don't like what you just said to me. You don't like what I just said to you. Tell me more about that. When I said, are you more, if you weren't so angry, what would you be? Would you be more afraid or would you be more sad? I understood that that felt more angering to you. Well, let's talk about that. So we would explore that. Yeah. So that you might find out, do I get angry when I feel threatened that I'm going to lose something that I have? Or do I feel threatened that I'm not going to get something that I want? And so we would explore those. Are those the only two? Not necessarily, but those are the primary ones. Really? Yeah. Okay. Primary. primary. And that could, but that could be intangible, right? Like yeah. I'm going to lose uh, dignity, or mm-hmm. social right. status. Yeah. yeah. Based yeah. on popularity. You just insulted me. So yeah. now everyone thinks whatever it is. Security. Certainty. Yeah. Okay. No, whatever. that's fascinating. So you think those bad decisions about re- relationships, you said, you said that's primarily the bad decision that people are making is, is the sort of falling into that and they're doing it. We, I found that that was interesting what you said around they're, they're making that same mistake around decision making with respect to relationships to try and gain mastery over that. And I, I had heard before and I had always assumed that people will re- repeat those same types of relationships because even if they're destructive, it's comfortable. They know they know the deal. They know what it is. That never quite made sense to me. But I, I had not heard anybody say they're doing it to, to gain mastery over it. In other words, I'm going to try this again, and maybe I'll get better at it. Uh, maybe I didn't change the last relationship or have success there, but maybe I will. Maybe I time. will this time. That's, that's interesting. You know, and oftentimes, interestingly enough, and this is part of a theory that I like a lot, it's called the Imago therapy. And it was developed by a, a PhD a therapist and his wife. Uh, his name was Howard Hendricks. But he says, people will tend to choose in a relationship um, the negatives and positives of their primary caregivers. Yeah. Their original primary caregivers. Well, I in learned other words, that in that attracted... book that you recommended yes. to me, uh, uh, yes. Keeping the Love That You Find yes. by uh, Harvey something, I think is his name. Harville Hendricks. Harville Hendricks. I said Howard, and, but I meant Harville. Yeah, I always Harvel. forget. Um, he, he um, you know, has you go through a bunch of different like worksheets mm-hmm. and things within that book. It's really interesting. It's very, very interesting and useful and helpful. It's just putting it into practice that is, again, threatening because you go, oh, this feels different to me. This feels wrong. Generally, any behavior that we change that's been a pattern is going to feel wrong, and that's air quotes around wrong, when we first do it. Yeah. So when you when you look at working with somebody to, to try and get out of that 
behavior pattern mm -hmm. where they're they're making that bad decision mm -hmm. ag again and again, uh, even if it's got a praiseworthy uh, objective, which is to gain mastery over it. I'm sure there are other decisions that you're trying to work with them on as well. But w what are you finding are the the things that are helpful in helping people make better decisions along those lines of, of recovery? Well, it's not it's not um, an easy process, and it's not a one size fits all process. Yeah, I wouldn't think it takes a lot of preparation. To get to that point, and when I'm when I say preparation, that's not really the appropriate word. It takes a lot of investigation, self investigation for the person first of all to recognize how am I defining myself based on what happened to me? Am I seeing myself as um, primarily in a victim role when I don't even recognize that I'm primarily in a victim role? Or am I a martyr? I got through that, you know, it happened to me, but by gosh, you I'm know. I'm so I tough, survived. yeah. You I'm know? so big and strong. And so yeah. always, always, you know, putting themselves in a role where they will be seen as rising above something. Or do, am do I both seen... of those just come down to your to some sort of narcissism? Not in like a diagnosed, like clinical sense, but I, I feel like a lot of times our egos cause us to place so much more importance on the things that we are involved in mm -hmm. or the fe or even our own feelings. Well, I think if we're talking about someone who has experienced abuse and they've come to yeah. me as counselor, um, the most important thing I can do is help them strengthen their ego because generally their ego has been in terribly mm. warped or damaged. And when I say warped, uh, it can cause them to be overly invested in a narcissistic kind of stance, or they can be in a uh, poor me self-deprecating, I'm always here to serve others, approval-seeking uh, role. And so we, we want to explore uh, in the therapeutic setting what identity are they most attached to at this point? Are they the victim? Are they the martyr? Are they the survivor? Or do they want to be the, what I call the thriver? Do they want to um, not carry a label around about something that happened to them back then, back there, that's never going to not have happened, that they can't change, but doesn't have to be their identity. One of the most favorite quotes I have from Joan Dedian, who is a, as an author, she was a screenplay writer, and she said, I've lost touch with a couple of people I used to be. Mm -hmm. And I love that, you know, yeah. and that's kind of the goal in uh, dealing with people who've experienced abuse is helping them to lose, hanging on to that identity of, you know, well, I'm a child, I'm an alcoholic, or I am a recovering alcoholic, or I'm a sexual abuse survivor, or I'm an incest survivor, or I'm a domestic abuse survivor, you know, um, whatever that identity is that they, it's, kind of what I call causes those good old bad old feelings they just kind of get comfortable with that and you find people using that as a as a crutch for excusing bad decision making oh I would think that that would be very much right so I mean that, so that would be an important reason to break away from this identity of, of sort of saying I'm a I'm a survivor of whatever, right? And, and using that as an excuse for, you know, and this is why I can't, you know, be successful in whatever endeavor because of this one event. That I would make, I would imagine that it, attaching ourselves to one of those identities would m mean that the next thing that happens, I'm putting into a box and, and, and I've almost predetermined how I'm going to react to it and the decisions that I'm going to make in in order to react to it, right? If I've got this survivor mindset or, or um, 
the, yeah, the, I guess the sort of victim mindset. It's like, well, the next thing that happens, the first thing I'm going to do is say, oh, poor me.